Awesome, thank you. Uh, last presentation of the day. And funnily enough, we started the conversations yesterday with a, an entrepreneur's perspective on design, and we're ending with a designer's perspective on entrepreneurship, so it's coming full circle. Uh, my name is Soeb Grewal. I lead a uh, firm in Delhi called Bold. And I've been a designer for the majority of my professional life. But at the same time, I've been involved with entrepreneurship for the, same amount of, uh, for the same amount of time, if not more. I started my first organization when I was still in college, and now I'm on my third startup of sorts. And often people ask me, so are you a designer or are you an entrepreneur? And I've actually had a lot of trouble answering that question. It's taken me a lot of time to reconcile what world do I live in? And I finally arrived at an answer that really makes sense to me. I think that I am a designer whose process and practice influences entrepreneurship. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. See, for me, creating a product, I mean, what, is, what does it mean to create a product? You're solving a problem for a user with a set of constraints. You know, that may be context, manufacturing, ergonomics, uh, materials. And at the same time, I think that designing a business is not too different. You're still trying to solve a problem you're still trying to solve for a user set. It's just that the set of variables are changing and the scale is changing. You know, what are, what are the qualities of a good designer or the qualities that you hear about a good designer? We're imaginative, we're, we're highly curious, we always want to solve problems. We're not afraid to get our hands dirty. You know, if we need to get out in the field and make stuff happen, we can make it happen. If we need to get in the lab and start coding and wireframing, we can make that happen. Uh, we're highly empathetic and we're, we're user-centered, and I think that I don't, I don't need to say that enough because that's been spoken about for the last two days. Um, we're very resilient, and for those of you who have gone to design school like I have, I think design school kind of does that to you where they tear you apart and the resilience just sort of comes with the practice. Uh, I also think that what, what we do really well is that we, we make meaning out of things. And uh, technology without design uh, lacks context, and that's what designers do. We make meaning and we add value on top of that. And we are used to working in very interdisciplinary and collaborative environments. Now, I could take designer out of this and put entrepreneur into this, and you could easily say that these are the qualities of a good entrepreneur as well. So I personally think that designers can make very good entrepreneurs, and by this I'm not, I'm not speaking of myself, but I'm speaking of people I've seen who have run businesses, led businesses, created startups. And you know, it's because designers and entrepreneurs are actually quite alike, and they're quite alike in how they, how they tackle problems and how they look at the world and how they take a systemic approach to, to solving problems. Uh, there are tons of synergies and intersections between this, and um, it's not just my way of thinking. It's happening out there right now. Designers are creating great companies. You know, whether that's Joe Gebbia, industrial designer, turned startup founder, created Airbnb, Matthias Correa, uh, graphic designer, turned entrepreneur, created Behance. And of course, these are global examples, but funnily enough, this is happening in our own backyard and we don't talk about it enough. SlideShare, Bookpad, Function Space, Now Floats, all amazing companies uh, that are creating global products, all venture backed companies. A few of these have been acquired as well, and this is just a small number of these. But um, it's, as much as VCs are sort of realizing that designers can be good founders and that there's an, an opportunity to back designer-led companies, being a good designer is not enough, much like being a good technologist is not enough. There's a certain set of challenges that come with uh, our process and our practice and the environments that we've been in that we have to sort of reconcile and get over. And I'm going to take you through a couple of these. And again, these have come through my own experience over the last five years. It's come from experience of other designer founders who I spoke to prior to this. Firstly, writing your own brief is really, really hard. And I know this sounds really simple, but it's not. I thought it was going to be super simple. I thought, you know, this is my first opportunity. I won't be told what to do. I'm not going to be told this is the challenge that you need to look at. But there are a lot of factors that, that you have to keep in consideration when you are writing a brief. You're, you're looking at so many different outcomes or at so many potential outcomes when writing a brief for your own business, which sort of says that 
a brief is almost akin to a business plan if you think about it. Um, we designers, as I mentioned before, we're, we're great makers and we're really detail oriented. You know, we want everything to be pixel perfect. But I think uh, one of the previous speakers today also mentioned this, that sometimes we get so caught up in the process of making that we don't know, uh, that we lose sight of the other things that are going on around us, especially when you're a single founder or when you're uh, leading a small team. And you need to be mindful of all the other factors which are not part of just the process of making. You need to be able to draw that line. This is probably the most controversial statement that I'm going to make. Think beyond the user. And I say this not, not because you should abandon the user, but I think that thinking about the user comes very naturally to us. We are user-centered people. We take a user-centered approach. But uh, there are so many other factors, market constraints, competition, revenue, business models, stuff that we're not traditionally taught in design school, stuff that we're not exposed to in traditional businesses, especially when you are a young designer making that leap. You have probably haven't had management experience before at a firm. So these are all things that you have to start considering other than the user as well. Design is, is, is not just the end product anymore. It's a small component, albeit a very powerful component, that helps us uh, solve the larger challenge at hand. So we need to move to a point where we're balancing the product aspect of what we're doing and the process aspect. And again, many of us have probably been used to setting up processes and taking a unique process at a company, but what we don't realize sometimes is that as much as our process is replicable, when we're creating a team, that process is driven by your personality and how you do things. Now, it's up to you as you scale your organization, when you stop being the designer and you start being the manager, to think about how am I taking my way of thinking or sort of critiquing my way of thinking and creating a design culture for my organization and putting those processes and systems in place so that we can actually scale this. This is a very hard thing to, to cope with as well, and I've, I've faced this personally. You won't be designing all the time, and that's really, really hard uh, because that's what we love to do. That's what we're trained to do. What this means is that you probably won't have a portfolio at the end of the three years, but that's fine. Your company is your portfolio. You have to accept that there are multiple other parts of the business that you have to get used to. You're the CTO. You're the CEO. You're the CFO. And Design, unfortunately, I've learned this the hard way, cannot be applied everywhere. As much as we say the design process works everywhere, you can apply it to so many different things, I've done it in practice, it doesn't. But your creativity and your creative problem solving can apply in different places. You just need to be able to know where to balance those factors. Now, typically, if you ask any entrepreneur, what are you good at? And they'll say that, you know, I do a little bit of everything. Does, entrepreneurs tend to be generalists. We designers are, for the most part, specialists. And even though I come from a background of industrial design where we'd like to say that we're the generalists of the design field, uh, we have to be able to strike that balance and we have to be able to find the connection between uh, you know, being a designer, but at the same time uh, figuring out all of the other roles that it means to be an entrepreneur. I'm not saying being uh, some sort of alphabet-shaped person, T-shaped or whatever, but it's, it's being able to find uh, when you stop being a designer and when you need to pick up all the other functions of the company. Sorry. Learn to love data. So like I said, there's one thing we're not taught about in design school, business. We also have an inherent fear of numbers, whether we admit it or not. We don't like looking at data. We say our approach is a qualitative approach, but that's changing. Data is everywhere. We have to learn to love it. We have to learn to accept it because, not because it's there, but because it actually really enriches our process. Learning about things like user churn, engagement metrics, it can help you design a much better product. Now, I think we designers are at a very, very exciting time. You know, design is being given um, the importance that it deserves in entrepreneurship. I think that we are moving beyond the point where design is just about the bells and whistles and a last mile consideration. Uh, people are re realizing that design, especially startups, I'm not speaking for industry, we've heard a lot about that, the startups are beginning to realize that design can be a phenomenal strategic advantage. And 
Personally, having run a business, having built a business, having run a design business after that, I'm still very, very bullish on this. And that's why we started Bold. The whole idea behind Bold is that we want to fund design-led companies, design and designer-led companies, where design and data is at the core of what they're doing. So we're talking about startups founded by designers, much like you, who are trying to solve grand challenges and problems, or maybe even just make people's lives easier, and provide them with the support that they require. On the other side, we're helping other entrepreneurs who may not be designers, but think like designers, appreciate design, to help them build out their solutions to the point where they're ready to scale. Because at Bold, we think that this intersection between design, data, and technology is actually the future of entrepreneurship. And what I mean by that is that where data is informing our decisions and technology is enabler, design adds profound meaning to whatever we're creating. And if startups understand that from the get-go, they have the possibility to let design or have design touch a million people or a million plus people. And that's the reason why we created Bold in the first place. We said, how can we make design ubiquitous in a country like ours? Of course, there are many other ways. But if good design stems from, uh, is baked into products and services that many lay Indians are going to use, that's going to have a profound effect of how we as a, as, a, as a culture start viewing, accepting, and appreciating design. Now, uh, there's another effort that I'm part of because, you know, this, this presentation's not enough. Me saying this isn't enough. Uh, there's, there's still a glass ceiling that designers have to break through. So I'm collaborating on a project led by a uh, Norwegian designer named Christian Leborg based out of Delhi called Design a Company where we're basically creating a platform, or let me say he's creating a platform, I'm only helping with content, um, where designers uh, can get resources in languages that they understand on how to create a business and how to create a company. And at the same time, entrepreneurs who want to understand design beyond uh, the regular available toolkits and uh, templates and everything online, but really understand how design can make a difference in what they're creating, can turn to, and this is launching next week, so I'd keep an eye out for it. And it's, it's not just us at Bold who are looking at it. There are many other people looking at this space. You know, there's the coalition in Delhi, which, is, which has started to help creative entrepreneurs and design entrepreneurs build and lead great companies. There's a designer fund in the Valley that's been doing this for the last three years and is behind a lot of great companies, like the Noun Project. So um, the gentleman who was in the panel before me said that no five billion or billion dollar company in India has built a great uh, global product. Uh, I, as much as I disagree with that, because I can give tons of examples of companies who have, in fact, some of the companies I mentioned have all created great global products, I'd still say that we should all take up that challenge and make it happen and build some stuff. Thank you.